this sucks. Why did it lock the orientation like that? It's, oh man. Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the Third Space Speaker Series. I'm Dr. John Johnson. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I'm the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion here at Whitman. Before we begin, uh, I would like to start by giving honor and respect to the indigenous peoples connected to the territory the college currently occupies. Whitman College is located on the traditional Cayuse, Umatilla, and Walla Walla homelands. We pay our respect to tribal, el to tribal elders, both past and present, and extend our respect to all indigenous people today. We honor their stewardship of the land and ecosystem and commit to continuing that important work. And I offer this land acknowledgement, not as a compulsory gesture of inclusion, but for the purpose of grounding us in the colonial history of the country and the region. Native scholar Matika Wilbur, who is Swinomish and Tulalip, asserts that our identity is inextricably connected to the land. So I want to encourage us all to take a moment to think about our relationship to the land we're on. Is the land connected to your sense of who you are? Do you see yourself as a guest, as an owner, as a steward, as a hostage or fugitive? How one sees that relationship may impact how they engage with the land and with the indigenous peoples connected to it. As an action beyond an acknowledgement, we want to encourage those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to visit the Temascalic Cultural Institute in nearby Pendleton to learn more about the people and history of this land. We also want to take a moment to shout out the Johnston Fix Foundation for their generous support that helped fund this series. The Third Space Speaker Series features scholars, artists, writers, and thought leaders whose work can help to advance existing interventions that work to move us towards inclusive excellence at Whitman. When we think about inclusive excellence, we want to think about a community that practices diversity without dominance, equity without benevolence, inclusion without othering, and belonging without assimilation. We also recognize that to move towards inclusive excellence, we need to embrace cultural humility, cultural pluralism, and cultural wealth. The Third Space Speaker Series is a manifestation of the college's stated values and functions as a space with transgressive possibilities and where those who are often confined to the margins are centered. In environments where one cultural narrative or framework reigns over others, where structural power is concentrated in the few and where traditions and systems reinforce hierarchical status relations, a third space serves as an interruption to that framework. To paraphrase Dr. Chris Gutierrez, in locations where dominant cultural values and marginalized counterscripts intersect, there exists the potential for joint construction of a new sociocultural terrain that serves, serves to shift our understanding of what counts as knowledge and knowledge representation. Welcome to the Third Space Speaker Series. Right. The format for our program will include presentations by each of our guests, followed by a moderated Q&A session. 
During the Q&A portion, we ask that your questions be concise and to refrain from offering lengthy commentary leading up to your question in order to allow more time for others. We also ask that we prioritize and provide space for student questions before we open it up more broadly to the audience. Finally, we ask that you use the microphone when speaking in order to ensure that the event is accessible to all. So before I introduce the speakers, I want to share a short video that helps to lead us into this dialogue. They say history is written by the victims, so when you see my picture in the book, it'll be consistent with my memory. Man, that's like in a, in a real practical way to say it's a, like it's a rap album. It's a rap album that is the text of the dissertation. So rather than it being like about rap or it being about like spoken word, it's actually done through those uh, particular modes of presentation. Because uh, I think it's something the stories of people that wanted to get it the way that they live in the world. Talking about what they live in, they really think that different from what we are spitting. And one of the reasons that I really wanted to do it that way is because you know, it's just like the, the metaphor that I use is like dope. Quali said, you know, I, I speak at schools a lot because they, they say I'm intelligent. You know, it's because I'm dope. If I was whack, I'd be irrelevant. I'm striving to be dope. Or if what we do is dope, like if I, we, I mean rappers, what happens is it gets cut a whole lot of times. Hip hop and sociology or hip hop and literature or hip hop and whatever else it is that we cut it with. Uh, this world of academia, you know, however we want to describe it. Is, is that world not ready for that dope in its like uncut form? Can the scholars not just create? or speak through hip hop as opposed to having it like mixed with something else in order for it to be acceptable. We already know that people can experience and talk about rap without having someone else filtering it. So, but I ain't on that slave shit. I ain't with that boss as you say. The most you get from me is a hock of this pit. And that's it. I'm saying, ain't no crime in standing my ground. I ain't gonna wait for people standing around. Hope they record it. No, I'm in danger and it's from the police. I'm supposed to call another police? Oh, man. I'm just kind of removing that filter and just like doing the rap, doing the dope routine, the dope, hoping that whatever happens, even if the, you know, the academic body, so to speak, like rejects it. I mean, I guess that's what dope does as well. It's, it's you know, overdose. I just feel like we've been doing hip hop or rapping or spoken word or graffiti beat boy and all of these different elements of hip hop have existed over here for so long as like ways that we can look at other things. I want hip hop to be the way that we look at things. I want the dope to be what I am and what I'm doing. It's very basically like I'm trying to be dope and do dope shit. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right on. So we are we are pleased uh, to have two dope scholars who do dope stuff with us this evening. Uh, the first presentation will be delivered by Dr. Jared Ball. Dr. Ball is first and foremost a father and a husband, and he's a professor of African American, African Diaspora Studies at Morgan State University, a historically black institution in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Ball is a student of history, mass communication, journalism, and Africana studies, and is part of the multi-platform production program at Morgan State. An active public scholar, Ball earned his PhD in journalism and mass communication from the University of Maryland and is the founder and curator of imixwhatilike.org, a multimedia hub of emancipatory journalism and revolutionary beat reporting. His 2011 book, I Mix What I Like, a mixtape manifesto, examined the liberatory potential of the hip-hop mixtape and his most recent text, The Myth and Propaganda of Black Buying Power, interrogates the way narratives of black buying power have been used to blame black communities for their own poverty based on arguments of squandered economic opportunity. That's a bad boy. <laughs> Following Dr. Ball's presentation, we'll hear from Dr. A.D. Carson. Dr. Carson is an assistant professor of hip hop and the global south at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Dr. Carson obtained his PhD in rhetorics, communication, and information design from Clemson University and his doctoral dissertation entitled Owning My Masters, The Rhetorics of Rhymes and Revolutions was a 34-track rap album that challenged and expanded traditional notions of scholarship. His more recent peer-reviewed album, published by University of Michigan Press, I Used to Love to Dream, 
is a mixtape electronic essay that combines the mixtape with personal and scholarly essay and has been described as the most important publication in digital rhetoric's history. Please join me in welcoming our third space speakers. Thank you very much. Um, greetings, everybody. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Hip-hop is still call and response, and despite some of the um, latest ons going between, uh, what is it, Busta Rhymes and Fat Joe and the, the anti-soda crowd, that, that is, those who are opposed to solidarity of dispersed Africans who want to separate everybody and act like something only could have occurred among black people here in the United States without black people themselves being connected to a broader African history that is itself divided up by colonization uh, and the imposition of, in its most latest iteration, uh, European colonialism. Um, and given, uh, where did brother go? Our interesting conversation just a minute ago, I want to come back to that. Uh, it's, it's, it was perfectly right on time. So anyway, uh, I'm going to not talk more than 20 minutes. I want to be respectful of the time and get into the conversation. So I'm just going to lay out a little bit of what is an overview of my approach to all of this, a combination of, and just a slight update on the bio. Uh, I'm now uh, in the uh, African American, African Diaspora Studies program at Morgan State University, where I get to really do more of the work I'm interested in, which blends my background in Africana studies and media studies, which is really, for me, the study of psychological warfare, uh, propaganda, and so on, often given the euphemism of branding, marketing, public relations, strategic communication, entertainment, pop culture. Anyway, um, so first, big thanks to uh, our hosts, um, Natasha Blake and Dr. John Johnson, uh, who, on top of all the support they've offered, started off with the pocket. I hope you all appreciate that out here in Washington. The other DC, the other Washington, I come from originally DC, is the, the founder of this, what Dr. Scott Brown calls the last unimpacted, authentic, uncolonized, decolonial, whatever you want to call it, free musical expression, that is go-go music coming out of DC, the pocket, the most authentic, multi-rhythm, poly-rhythm, it's, it's amazing. So shout out to Vibe Dan, and thank you, Dr. Johnson, thank you. All right, anyway, um, <clears throat> everything I'll uh, overview tonight is discussed and written more about at length on my website, I mix what I like .org, and among and discussed among uh, my comrades at blackpowermedia.org and our YouTube channel under the same name, uh, where I'm also streaming now, so shout out to everybody there, too. Um, so essentially, I work from, again, I love the, the, the oh, and big shout out to our ASL interpreters, by the way. Thank you very much. They're, they're working very hard. Uh, but, um, so I, I appreciate the, the, the initial commentary about uh, colonialism and starting with that, because I, I have always applied that to my own work. Uh, even as we talk mostly, as I talk mostly about black America or African America or African Americans. Um, and what I've tried to do with my work is revive, and maybe we can come back to how I got to this, I think it's kind of an interesting story, but, but uh, revive an internal colonialism theory or, or reapply it anew, something that had been born in the 60s and 70s, which basically, short story, is that black people in the United States should be analyzed, theorized, and, uh, and organized around the same principles that guide a colonial relationship. So whatever was happening traditionally between Europe and Africa, Europe and Central and South America, was also happening internally here. And as the late great Kwame Nkrumah said, when you practice capitalism, you're practicing domestic and, uh, colonialism. So from that point of departure, my argument is simply that black people, and when, it, when we're even talking about something like hip hop, are mined for their, in this case, cultural uh, resources. Uh, they are held spatially separate. Uh, even, even, even where I live now, in Columbia, Maryland, in Howard County, which is, they say is the, the, 
one of the best places to live in the country. The public school system there has rates of segregation internally that rival 1950s in the Deep South. That is, once you all get into the building, whether they call it GT courses, all the black kids are kept out of there. So once they all go into the same building, it separates and all the black and brown people are over here and mostly the rich white and some Asian pockets are over here having a very different experience. They don't even see each other literally in the course of a day. So anyway, so this relationship is what governs the relationship between whatever black people produce and what happens when it gets plugged into the machinery. Uh, so whatever work I've done in terms of hip hop, whether it's with, with uh, my book or some other work that I've done, it has been to try to challenge basically the, the, the grand narrative about how hip hop emerged. That is that popular narrative that out of the South Bronx, these poor black and brown people created something. They fought the system and produced something that now has billions of dollars, generates billions of dollars, 40 billion, 50 billion in all told annually. LL Cool J was just on a, uh, uh, on a live, responded in defense of our generation saying that, that, that out of nothing, hip hop has, governs the world now. The whole world is rocking to hip hop. It's culturally responding to hip hop. So everything since those humble origins in the South Bronx has gone in sort of a linear direction, ever improving, getting better. Even if some said it led to the browning of America and the, the election of our first black president. Then a few people like me come around and say, well, at the end of all of that, what is the material condition of the people that we're talking about? Go back to the South Bronx today, it's worse than it was in the 70s. Overall, black people have deteriorating material conditions to the point where by 2053, whatever wealth is left will be zero. The Economic Policy Institute calls it a permanent recession. That even when the economy is doing well, black people are not doing well. Mass incarceration or surveillance in our homes is going up. So what then is the role of all this celebrity? Well, Kwame Ture said 50, 60 years ago, black visibility is not black power. And if we just read in The Guardian the other day, the British state just finally admitted, though some of us have read some of the documents and knew this already, that they had been involved in a grand an effort to suppress Kwame Ture, that is formerly known as Stokely Carmichael, which is what they called him in the paper, not acknowledging his name change or his advanced work. Uh, but they were acknowledging, they said, even The Guardian reported, we didn't like the fact that he was trying to spread among black people around the world this idea of pan-Africanism and socialism. Oh, oh no. Because that colonial relationship can't be upset. And of course, he was arguing for an anti-colonial, decolonial struggle here in the United States linked up internationally. So then I connect that with what the counterintelligence program said, of course, developed by the FBI here in the United States um, in the 60s officially to suppress and wipe out and destroy all the radical movements, communist, socialist, the labor movement, and I always have a little, my little funny story that, that on both ends of my family, they got everybody. My mother and the Jews, they went after all of them, suppressed all of them, snatched them up, locked them up for the labor movement, being communists, put them under surveillance, going back to the 20s, all documented, oddly enough, of course, because the FBI has everything. My father's side, same thing, civil rights, black power, all manner of surveillance with the goal, of course, to disrupt all radical movements. Explicitly stated, Kwame Ture listed by name as a potential threat. So fast forward, just to stay with the time, fast forward what was one of the main responses of the state to Kwame Ture and that black power movement. So one of the things, one of the goals was, okay, this colonial relationship post-World War II has to continue. The U.S. is the single hege hegemon at that point, wants to project itself as, in its version of capitalism is the only way 
Propaganda, psychological warfare goes through the roof. Yasha Levine, in his book, Surveillance Valley, talks about how the very people that created the psychological warfare that would be used in the jungles of Vietnam brought that home here to the United States specifically to target black people as counterinsurgency threats. And then I always think it's funny if you go back and read the initial reports about Nat Turner in the newspaper, the Nat Turner Rebellion, 1833, they called him and his band of insurgents by the same name, this idea. So what is this insurgency? So black people here are the same insurgent threat to the colonial status and the relationship of the United States to the world that the Vietnamese were, that the Soviet Union was, that Cuba still is, et cetera, and so forth. So the same tactics are applied. So what does that mean? Of course, it's military. We, all, we, we get that part, assassinations. There's always that. So as, some, as I talk about a little bit in my work, Jay-Z is born on the very day Fred Hampton is killed in Chicago. And I note the, the, the differences. Fred Hampton, the socialist, was armed struggle, socialist revolution. Jay-Z's on, on Twitter just, what, a few days ago talking about, don't get mad at me for wanting to be a black capitalist. <laughs> and when you call me a capitalist, it's almost like you're calling me the N-word. I told you that I can't be I can't help the poor if I'm one of them. I rapped about that. I told you I'm a businessman. I'm a businessman. I told you, I told you I'm not a rapper, I'm a hustler. So don't come now and tell me when I'm rapping this capitalism and praising the billions me and B got, and I don't want that smoke. I don't want that smoke. Don't get mad at me, you're calling me the N-word. And I said, wow, that's deep, because right after, right at the, the tail end of the 60s into the 70s, Richard Nixon and his administration said, you know what? Kwame Ture and his, this Stokely Carmichael, this black power stuff is a threat. We need to redefine black power to mean black capitalism, black mainstream participation in electoral politics. Start a business. Now, we got our wealth like any colonizer. We came in with the weapons. We wiped out the military. Whoever stood up, heads rolled. Warfare. After that, like Fernand said, we came in with the psychic violence, the psychological warfare, the cultural appropriation. In terms of hip hop, as we could fast forward, what did Fernand say? Culture doesn't, the colonialist doesn't kill the culture of the colonized. You fix it in a colonial form and use it to testify against the very population. So come to the, 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 the narrative that has emerged around hip hop, this linear progression of it started all, what did Drake say, from the bottom, now we here. Who's we? Drizzy? Who's we? The black collective is worse off. Globally, the Pan-African, the beauty, the Pan-African uh, waves that coalesced in New York City to, to produce all of this, look at the diaspora, it's a mess. And look where the diaspora does well. I just read a report that was talking about Botswana is doing well relative to the, you know, don't look at their relationship to De Beers and Diamonds and why they got this nice little hookup of a, of a setup here. Don't look at that. Just focus on the fact that this is an example of the possibilities. So is that what we want? So if we give up everything and our resources, we get a little relative, we get a little Wakanda. Team Killmonger right here, don't get it twisted, don't get it twisted. Killmonger was right, they killed the wrong hero. I didn't plan to go here, but let me do this real quick. Check it out, check it out though, check it out, it's perfect. This is my favorite part of how that, look at the original, look at the black, never, first of all, shout out to my man, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs. Please go check his work on the history of the Marvel comic. You gotta understand the history of that character before you can understand what they did in this film or why they did what they did in this film. And don't get me started on the Woman King. I already got in tr trouble with that. They did the same thing. They said it's the same model. They only made the Woman King because they made Black Panther. They did the same thing. But here's, I'll leave it here for now. What did they do? 
Remember what we're talking about in terms of the baseline of colonialism. If you know anything about the history of, of Western imperialism, particularly in Western Africa, look at the, in, in, particularly in the Congo, in the rise of somebody like Patrice Lumumba, go look at the speech Patrice Lumumba gives to the, to the Western powers of the world when he assumes power. What is this, 1960? And he comes up there, he's got the same sash, check the check, they got the same sash. That's how I knew when I saw the movie, The Black Panther, they had him in the sash at the end. I was like, you, yeah, you slick, slick, slick. Lumumba goes up there and says, okay, everything's done. Colonialism's over. All of our resources are ours. The Western powers are out. It's a wrap. And immediately, if you go check the records, the, 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 Western, the Western powers were already in communication. What are we going to do with this dude? Phone calls up, up, up. Everybody from Belgium to France to, to the United States, England, of course. Patrice Lumumba's deposed, assassinated, terribly tortured, body destroyed, ruined, et cetera, and so forth, done away with. Come to the Marvel Black Panther character. Same sash, and at the end of the movie, what does he say? All of Wakanda's resources are yours. And the white CIA agent in the back of the room just smiles. Yes. It's a complete 180 from the anti-colonial messaging that has been expressed just again recently in the pages of the Guardian newspaper are a threat to those in power. If you go and read the COINTELPRO documents from this country, why was Kwame Ture a threat? Why was Dr. King a threat? Why was Malcolm X a threat? Why were the Panthers a threat? They wanted to materially redistribute the wealth all of us are helping to create that goes to a handful of people. That's fundamentally what it was all about, and they were willing to do it by any means necessary. So what, what happens to them? Imprisonment, death, exile, and then their images are constantly reproduced in a colonial form that testifies against us, so much to the point that they can't even do it to, to Kwame Ture anymore. And in the film Selma, Ava DuVernay cuts him completely out. He's not even mentioned. Let me just come back to hip hop very quickly here. Because it's all part of the same thing. If ideas and messaging can be seen as a threat, if pop culture itself becomes a battlefield, if the media, as, if, as Chris Simpson and others have done great work in exposing, is said by those in power to be the fourth arm of the military, if they want full spectrum dominance, as they say, if you go and even look at the history of my own field, mass communication, it is all about the development of ways to manipulate people in all forms of, again, whatever euphemism we want to call it, it's all psychological warfare at the end of the day. To manipulate people, manage people's public opinion, to reduce them as a threat, to make them malleable. So then when you plug in hip hop, even from the beginning, the narrative, histor the historical narrative of hip hop, I think, humbly speaking, is entirely mistold. So in my little bit of work, I've challenged some of those, some of those key canonical texts and said, look, this, this narrative you've wanted to produce that, that tells us as, as, as uh, uh, what did old boy Dan Charnas say in his book, says that hip hop is an American capitalist success story. Well, yeah, from the perspective of a capitalist, because they're making hand over money, billions, hands over fists, and the people producing it are not threatening politically. The messages are not threatening politically, not the ones that they can make popular, and we can talk about that later. There's definitely a mechanism for popularization that's more sophisticated and manageable now than ever. Then we have to go back and check this history. Um, and look from even the beginning, the first track that Sylvia Robinson recorded, the Sugar Hill Gang that produced all of this, that, just from the very beginning, she was working for a record company hustle to produce a hit, to produce money to save her company and put together a group that was completely fraudulently put together. People rhyming other people's rhymes, claiming to be other people. They weren't even the people they claimed to be. So from the very beginning, of its commercial engagement. Hip hop has been turned into the machinery that has slowly over time been, been, been weaponized against the population that created it. As soon as they realized it was not just a fad, and this is where I'll start to wrap up here. 
where my generation, with all due respect to my own generation, where we, where we collectively messed up was that in our desire to defend this new and beautiful collective art form, our right to do it, the right of poor and oppressed people to produce beauty out of nothing, which is what they were doing. With all that attempt to defend it, we missed out on the political context in which this was occurring, the colonial context in which this was occurring. Our desire to help it survive led to people being willing to attach it to the very mechanisms of power corporations, most, most notably, that allow all art to be destroyed and weaponized against us as a population. That's why we end up where we end up. That's why so much of the community is reflecting what has been projected to, towards them. And why politically today, we are no more powerful than when Kwame Ture was arguing and claiming 50, 60 years ago, black visibility is not black power. You cannot just look at people on TV and elected even to high office and not recognize that that relationship undergirding all that has not fundamentally changed. So what we end up with is, to follow the colonial logic, a very neo-colonial reality. The pundits that are presented before and put before people are selected just as the artists are for popularity and mass distribution as a weapon So just as there was a counterintelligence program, we have to go back to the history that keeps getting left out of in, the, in, the, in the 1990s, particularly of the rap intelligence program. And the hip hop cop that was primarily leading that operation just popped up in another documentary as a regular talking head pundit. And I'm like, hold up, that's the dude that was setting people up and snitching on people and planting stuff and doing all kinds of stuff to rappers in the 90s. And he's now one here talking to like a legit talking head. And that's how we end up with Jay-Z, where I started, saying, don't call me a black capitalist like you would call me the N-word. Appreciate my billions and my wife's billions. And the fact that our children, not yours, but our children and their children will never have to work again. And that should be enough for you. My success should be enough for you. Because like he said, I've been drinking Cristal since y'all thought it was beer. Anyway, let me stop there. Look forward to the conversation. Thanks again. Peace out. Thank you. Thank you. We're just doing a, we're just doing a tech. We're just changing the the source of the presentation. Yeah. Uh oh. See, I shouldn't have said that. 
Do I belong to the communities presented and represented in my work? I most definitely do not see myself as a translator of any sort, and my work most certainly doesn't come from a belief that I am best equipped or capable of speaking on the behalf of others who are somehow imagined as voiceless. On the contrary, part of my work is to create space for those very folks. Quote, the world's most marginalized, as uh, Catherine McKittrick describes how the figure of the human is tied to epistemological histories that presently value the genre of the human that reifies Western bourgeois tenets. The human is therefore wrought with physiological and narrative matters that systematically excises them. The idea of, of genre figures prominently in my work. I didn't go get a PhD to necessarily learn about hip hop. My goal wasn't to become, and it still isn't, to be a hip hop scholar. The tendency remains with scholarship that deals with hip hop to, to write about it. And I think about the preposition about in my own work and find that when I attempt to write about some object, phenomenon, theory, etc., I can never truly capture what I want to get at. With my work, I'm interested in doing I'm interested in doing work by writing through hip hop to attempt to raise discussions of many other issues. Rather than the work being about hip hop, my work is about many things through hip hop to avoid at least remaining on the periphery of the potential hip hop possessors as a means through which knowledge is produced and presented. Scholarship written about hip hop is valuable and necessary. I read a lot about hip hop and I also take seriously all the work I encounter that is being done through hip hop as I hope folks would take mine seriously. I also find it useful to write about the music to convey certain ideas contained in the music, um, particularly those ideas that might be in teaching. One of the things that I've written uh, is in a chapbook that uh, takes its inspiration from, from reading the Kittrick's edited volume. It's titled Sylvia Winter on Being Humanist Praxis. In that text, um, Winter says, uh, our mythoi, our origin satires are therefore always formulaically patterned so as to co-function with the endogenous neurochemical behavior regulatory system of our human brain. Humans are then a biomutationally evolved hybrid species, storytellers who now storytellingly invent themselves as uh, being purely biological. With this, Presently, or particular presently biocentric macro origin stories are overrepresented as the singular narrative through which the stakes of human freedom are articulated and marked. This makes me think about history as a genre of storytelling. James Baldwin says that we're trapped in it and it's trapped in us. The genre of storytelling perpetuates the genres of the human and our values thereof. We keep telling ourselves who we are with these stories, and we keep being what we said we were. What we are now are products of our storytelling, trapped in the trap we've written. Currently, objects don't write their own histories. But my question is, can they? If we think of rappers, hip-hop artists, as objects about which stories are told, rather than a genre of the human capable and also incredibly adept at narrating our own histories, presents, and futures, then it might be logical to conclude that rappers writing raps aren't producing academic knowledge. Or that being a rapper might somehow preclude understanding us as people who rap and also do any number of other things, which might include writing and researching or just living our black ass lives. But the power of storytelling is strong. Narrative matters. Narratives matter. So I decided if I was going to be treated as an object in the midst of other objects borrowing from Franz Fanon, despite my expectation that I be considered a person among people, we could see something emerge through our attention to genre. Think about the bodies of Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Walter Scott, and Sandra Bland, among the countless others who were taken from us while I was in my doctoral program. They can tell us quite a bit about this trap if we listen to Sylvia Winter. Consider these folks a genre of the human that 
holds a different value that matter differently than other American bodies, humans. Then, to assert that their lives matter, it's just a matter of perspective, an objective fact to some, counter-logical to others, but nonetheless deeply entangled in physiological and narrative matters. If we ask what is to be done with Trayvon's voice on the 911 call after his body has had its life taken from it, or with Eric's I can't breathe after it's no longer a possibility, or with Sandra saying, but I'm still here, forcing us to question the truth in that statement. I borrow a question from Alexander Wachelier. He asks, what happens once the black voice becomes disembodied, severed from its source, recontextualized, and re-embodied and appropriated, or even before this point? Is there a use for those bodies, those voices? I argue that on some level they function as well, technological bodies, embodied technology, in the service of reification of a master genre of the human. Martin Garner, Brown, Scott, Bland, they've all been narrated at points as malfunctioning. Our cries for justice futile because bad technology, things like these, are destroyed, dismissed with no mortification, often with impunity because no one should face recrimination for doing what must be done to maintain the order of things. Other bodies, like those of the Emanuel and I murdered in cold blood in their Charleston, South Carolina church, were narrated as instruments used to turn the page on an ugly chapter in American history. Those narratives attempt to convince us that they should be commended for their sacrifice in helping us remove the Confederate flag from the South Carolina State House grounds. Similar narratives uh, are engaging this kind of storytelling invention in the aftermath of the more recent massacres in Buffalo, New York, the Uvalde, uh, Texas, Rob uh, Elementary School, and Highland Park, Illinois, already shaping realities we inhabit in response, encouraging us to forget, to not politicize, to repeat the same performances of care we did the previous 10 times it happened, trapped in the trap. Michael Brown and Eric Garner, these narratives posit were already broken, disobeying orders, and therefore undeserving of the respect or dignity afforded proper people by authorities. Their bodies lying on a sidewalk in Staten Island or in the street in Ferguson are no different than broken televisions or stereo equipment put out on the curb for eventual disposal. So if mine too was understood, was, was understood as a technological body or my existence embodied technology, perhaps the genre of writing I brought into the space of academic study is something that can be done with the disembodied voice, severed from its source, recontextualized and re-embodied and appropriated. Perhaps it could be the kind of dope that makes the phantom emerge or vanish, that provides a new self-critical, analytical way of listening, thinking of Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man when he was reflecting on how it felt to be high. After all, Rappers also function as a particular genre of human. Despite the immense success of hip-hop culture and the music forms it spawned since, rap as an art continues to be portrayed as bound to a cultural wasteland. All American tales of overcoming success, despite what rap represents culturally, purport to uplift hip-hop artists. But they're harmful if they accept the tacit argument that hip-hop is indeed an American cultural landfill from which those successes have been salvaged. Hip-hop artists, lauded for educational credentials, university teaching appointments, business ventures, and otherwise successful careers achieved their acclaim largely in relation to this narrative cultural construction of pathology. In reporting about many artists who find success adjacent to their careers as rapper, attention between person and salvaged thing remains. This even happens when people write about me and my work. Worse, that tacit acceptance spills into the ways ordinary people who experience tragedies are described. The word rapper operates like a Parisian knight, scooping out the humanity from the body it describes, leaving the hollow expectation of death and the specter and spectacle of violence in its place. The descriptor renders them something other than a person and more akin to a barely salvageable thing. It often indicates something people should be protected against. 
that people should be relieved when it's exterminated. They become a, a boogeyman in the public imagination. In the most unjust circumstances, the word rapper translates tragedy into presumption. Because the ex expectations attached to a rapper already renders them other than human, the actual death is ritual, it's rote. This is a double tragedy because the victim is unkillable, they're also unmortable. Time and energy that might be spent in mourning is divided in trying to produce humanity for the victim, attempting to prove, prove they have a life worthy of respect. The dearth of public mourning only amplifies this personal absence. The deaths of Willie McCoy, Eric Reason, George Floyd, Lexi Elijah, China Rogers, and Jordan Davis have all been described in relationship to rap music. McCoy, Reason, and Floyd were killed by police officers. Headlines describing them as rappers after their deaths read as a test at justification by dehumanization. Similar headlines about Lexi Elijah and China Rogers seem to dismissively associate their drug-related deaths to hip-hop. Michael Dunn admittedly called the music playing from the SUV occupied by Jordan Davis and his friends thug music or rap crap. Awaiting trial, he was recorded on the phone speculating if Davis and his friends were gangster rappers, citing YouTube videos he'd seen. Dunn's defense depended on his victims being viewed as thugs by association with rap. However, somehow, the reporting rendered rap and thug um, synonymous with loud. So the killing was dubbed the loud music murder in the proceeding called the loud music trial, making it sound less offensive and racist than it actually was. Throughout hip hop history, rappers admittedly have been at the forefront of constructing ourselves as anti heroes. Bombastic performances, masculinity, violence, intimidation, gun ownership, misogyny, and a plethora of phobias are meant to signal a kind of authenticity that audiences also buy into. The violence committed and perpetuated by people who rap is real and concerning, as all other violence perpetuated. I should probably say that again. The violence rap is real and concerning, as all other violence perpetuated. This commentary is not offered as a blanket defense of any other rapper accused of crimes, but rather a caution against accusations of people that are issued because they rap. Mm -hmm. We must seriously contend with the ways rappers are automatically assumed to be ex exceptionally deviant. Mm -hmm. To be clear, if the litany of descriptors that I just offered is the rubric, it's obvious rap isn't some special place America goes to experience them, even if lots of people consume rap music. These abhorrent behaviors highlighted in rappers are American values that rappers adopt, living and surviving here. Rap concerts like Travis Scott's 2021 Astro World Festival in Houston aren't unique spaces where America sees violence. And while it still might signify exceptional mayhem and bloodletting to white Americans as it did in Run DMC's heyday, rap music isn't the cause of violent crime. Because genre categories function as descriptors of people as much, if not more, than the music to which they allegedly correspond, it's understandable how signifiers like rap and urban are interpreted through racist lenses. The latter term, inseparable from America's history of redlining, and has ultimately become code for black. Um, neighborhoods described as urban in New York and Chicago, where drill rappers live, are places in America and byproducts of America. Rats themselves don't kill people, just like movies or television shows or any other cultural product don't create violence. They reflect the violence that already exists. In other words, America is a violent country. America values violence, misogyny, sexism, homophobia, racism, etc. So seeing those things in any cultural expression coming from people living and creating under these conditions is just not surprising at all. Context is key when making the correlative claim. These understandings of genre help us see that music emerging from these places is a reflection of crisis, not the source of it. This is what I was thinking about when, um, I'm, I'm getting close to the end. <laughs> when I was writing my dissertation, uh, the album Only My Mask is the Rhetoric of Rhymes and Revolutions. It's also what I'm gesturing toward with the album since. Uh, Sleepwalking Volumes 1 and 2, I Used to Love to Dream, and um, 4, Talking to Ghosts, which I recently released, or re-released, with an essay titled Beyond a Better Hell. And these narrative matters, I assume, are incredibly important to anyone interested in hip-hop being studied in the academy. 
They have even central to the ways artists and scholars like me are described to and by our academic colleagues. Part of the important work for me is to ask what I give up. To whom does it do service for me, borrowing from Ellison again, to be called one thing and then another while no one really wishes to hear what I call myself? For what makes some of us invisible? For what rappers and rats say and do that writing about or around us blunts? Hip-hop in academia should be deeply accountable to the places and people from which it comes, the communities these academic institutions so often exclude. It should also be accessible and receptive to critiques about accountability and course and campus demographics as well as the demographics of the professoriate. This can't happen without deep consideration and ethical work by the people who have the power to use hip hop in the academy in hollow attempts at multiculturalism or shallow diversity efforts that only provide the veneer of progress. In that regard, academia still has a lot to learn. And I hope that some of us are up to the challenge that this presents. Um, I should probably wrap up here. I was going to say this other thing, but you know, I think we're good. And we're going to have a. Um, no, 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 I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Gonna do it. Do it. <laughs> they want what's similar to what's been on the radio. They say it's no big deal, but if I'm for real, it is. But pay no credit, cash, debit, flash, let it pass with no assist, no resistance, no illicit, no see the difference. I really wish I gave a fuck about what other people do. I really don't, but want you to feel like I wrote this song for you. But it was right as block that prompted it, and me who wanted it. My promises, my narcissistic nature won't be charmed by which ever one's opinionated statements about how I made it. I'm elated if you hate it. I'm complacent if you love it. I put myself way above it. See it like an ant farm. Can't harm what you can't touch, and I give it up before I let it be perverted. You heard it from me directly. It's silly if I ask you to, but I don't respect me. Let me make myself real clear here. You think it's cooning and buffooning and doing more damage to you than who you think is your enemy. Foolish to think that men will see you and then emulate your example. You see it clear like a sample. The opportunity's ample, so you don't put up a fight. The cell is already there, because it's your copy to write. Write a passage is the mass of misinformation you faced and made believe. You understood that was the ace of the sleeve, so you sat down at the table to play. They made it look fun. You thought you had the high card. They told you you were the one, and you were. Sometimes you play a game and win, but despite your winning at it, sometimes you find something that's missing in life. Like for me, I take that L before I take a few dollars if I got it into some product that I know to be harmful. What's the honor of a nigga being a nigga for sale? You may as well put on a heavy chain and work in the field. How do you make a slave stay a slave? Tell him he can make a slave and make some money while he's at it. It's simple and tragic. Peace. Uh, 
Uh, I'm curious as into like how have you seen hip hop evolving, not just within the United States, but also when it is taken abroad. Like, is it telling the same story or is the story changing depending on the culture? And also now with like social media and stuff, a lot of people are making music, like almost anybody can do it. And do you think the value, do you think the story, the meaning is still the same behind the music or has that been lost? Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Appreciate those questions. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I feel like um, it's really difficult to answer because there's so many different things that are going on, as Dr. Ball indicated, you know, like there are, I mean, I feel like a lot of times when, when I'm being asked questions and folks say hip hop, like what they're, what, what they mean is like what is popular. And I think that that's much different than, you know, like the practices that like me and the folks that I know in, in, are, are engaging in, or at least, you know, like the kind of work that I, that I appreciate. Um, and unfortunately, that means that um, lots of folks in other cultural contexts probably, like, if, like what's going on in these places that I'm describing won't look familiar to people who, who, uh, who experience hip hop wherever they are. Um, and, and so, and I've, had, I've experienced that where someone, where, where I'm in, you know, I'm in another country and then someone says, well, you know, like this isn't real hip hop, this is whatever. And I'm like, that's, you know, that's, that's an interesting take. But like, what, what is it that you mean by real hip hop? And so I think that there are a lot of different things going on in a lot of different places. And so it would be, I just don't know that, that, that the kind of specificity that you would need to be able to answer that question is available to anyone. Um, I certainly have witnessed lots of really cool and interesting things going on, but um, but like so far as to like answer the question, are the same stories being told, or um, you know like has it veered a whole lot from you know what was going on in the '60s and '70s? Um, I, I think that the answer is probably yes and no. Uh, the ways that uh, things have changed um, are are maybe too many to like to try to enumerate, but I feel like I'm not really giving you an answer and just saying that there is no answer. Um, and I apologize for that. It's just that I, I couldn't, I don't think that I could offer something that, um, that I would be able to stand behind, you know, with any, like, validity. So, uh, I'll try to answer it um, really the only way I know how. So, first of all, uh, shout out to Hip Hop Pantsula. Shout out to Prophets of the City. Shout out to the late, great Ben Sharpa. All these are MCs out of South Africa, closer to my generation, perhaps, than what I assume might yours be. Um, but Ben Sharpa asked the question, why do we need a police service? They're here to suppress, um, why do we need, his point was, I, his point was we need a police to do what the police do. What Malcolm X said to do locally what the military does internationally, suppress the population, violently repress the population, and, may, and pave way for colonial takeover and corporate, ease the corporate process. Um, look at the conditions as I just read the other day from South Africa. Materially speaking, the conditions are not improving since apartheid said have ended. I've had the privilege of sitting in a room uh, with the late, great Dr. James Turner, the, 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 the founding director of the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell, when he had invited Desmond Tutu to pass through as he came through Cornell at the time. And a brother from one of the townships shouted him down and said, you're leading, you're popularly leading a movement that is softening the reality of our worsening conditions. I see the same thing happening here. The stories that some of the artists that I was talking about out of South Africa that are being told here and there still to this day are suppressed. We just heard an example of what the art can do. But if we start to go through the process of, of, of producing popularity, we start to see that with all due respect to, to our brother here and so many other talented artists, they can produce any, any amount more 
that are more popular, more popularly distributed and penetrating into people's homes that have a whole different message and approach. Um, how that's done, I think, is a little more complicated than is given credit, but if we look at today, there is, there is two major distributors through which all these entities have to go. Lee or Cohen, who was a thorn in the side of hip hop for my, for my entire life, is now the head of YouTube Music, which is the busy, biggest music distributor in the world. I'm like, how the hell, wait, how the hell? We were called this dude Liar Cohen for 40 years. I blink after a, 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 a supposed advanced movement and he has a more powerful position as a gatekeeper, huh? So my point is, as many others have done, you know, I, you know, I mix what I like. I've taken as a name as an honorific to Steve Biko, who, who wrote uh, his work as, under Frank Talk as I write what I like. And when I was doing emancipatory mixtapes, not as a real DJ, more as a compiler and a journalist, whatever I was doing, no disrespect to DJs, I want to be clear about that. Um, that, 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 you know, I wanted to take that same ethic. We're trying to produce art and cultural expression that advances an anti-colonial struggle. But at the same time, and, and my point is, I was, I was compiling in that all this great music that had all this real energy that was still being produced, that is still being produced to this day, telling the stories that need to be told, that aren't on what would be today's radio, that aren't on the playlist, that aren't on the front page of iTunes when you click on that and get that very paid for positioning of some artist to be there. Um, to, to almost to prove, to try to prove every mixtape, look, there's all this art that's out here. Why do you think you can't hear it? Why do you think it's not as, are you really trying to tell me that so-and-so and such-and-such -and -such is the best artist you could possibly hear? Are you serious? We just heard an example again of what I'm talking about. I mean, Hip Hop Pants, who I mentioned, he did, he did it, they did an album with, with my man Gabriel Asheru Ben, another hip hop scholar and practitioner, brilliant MC, amazing MC. Of course, no disrespect. I claim him from DC, but you get you get the UVA. You know, but you know, but but the point is, as my point is, no matter how brilliant he is, he can't get the shine that other people are going to get because of the message, the the, what, the 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 content. And as I was trying to say in my initial presentation, the content, the politics are is a a, 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 com, a major concern of those in power. So they work meticulously to find ways to suppress it in a very sophisticated and a beautiful way that doesn't appear to be happening. Anyway, I, I, don't, I don't think I did your question justice. Also, shout out to Black Power Station and, and, um, and McConnell, South Africa as well. Right doing some dope work. And um, it's just a, it's a, it's a community making space where, you know, like artists come and really just like read and make and that's, you know, I think that it's, um, so as I said, yeah, there are these, these places that, um, and folks that, that I've met that, you know, we know will probably never be really popular, but they're also doing transformative work within those communities. Um, and so uh, to talk about like the particular ways those happen, I think it's, you know, it's easier to, you know, to acknowledge a few people. Um, it's much harder to talk about like what's happening on the whole, even though on the whole there are some things that we know, you know, are going on. <laughs> first of all, there's no, let me just say this, let me, let, me do this, let me just say this first real quick. If I understood your question right, I teach it in HBCU, so there's no pursuit of no wealth or capital. <laughs> Let's just be clear. Let's just be very clear. Right. Um, 
honestly, I, I, to be perfectly honest, I became a professor because I couldn't think of anything else that I would want to do that I could legitimately be seen to do as a career. Uh, and when I saw what I perceived at the time was my faculty's life and schedule as an undergraduate student, I thought this could work. And then at one point I really did think I was gonna be a revolutionary and I would just have a PhD. So I have the, I mean, it is beautiful. I mean, I love the fact that I, you know, in the process of getting a master's and a PhD that I got this, I, you know, and taking on all the debt that I still have. And my joke is I only want people to acknowledge my PhD because I'm still paying for it. <laughs> but I love the, the ability to, be, to, to have it institutionally built into my life to sit and study. It was a tremendous privilege to be able to sit in libraries all day and read, d discuss, debate with colleagues and peers, sit at professors' offices. I mean, I, Dr. James Turner in particular used to sit in his office all the time, just talk, 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 just listen, have him talk, me listen. And so, so that's why, and then, then I th you know, when I thought I was actually gonna be a legit revolutionary, like for real, for real, I was like, this is beautiful because you get the space, you get the time, you get the, you know, not only to study, but you can make your own schedule. You can, you know, disappear at times and get away with it. You know, there's all kinds of stuff that can happen as a faculty member you can't get away with in other fields. Um, the revolutionary part failed. And then I just, you know, did the regular thing of pursuing tenure and full professorship and all of that. And um, have found that that does not prevent you from being woefully underpaid and marginalized. But I think that has more to do with the content of the work than uh, anything else. Academia, like any other institution, is a hostile space. This is not, and people misunderstand this all the time. Um, academics, I think, are by and large a lot stronger than people give them credit for because you are encouraged to go into isolation and struggle and fight independently against an institution that tells you to go do all this research but then will punish you for sharing your conclusions having done it. I came back and I, told, I said, I just read what you told me to read <laughs> and reached these conclusions. It's very clear. And you just don't like the conclusions, so now I get to be punished for it. So, you know, there's, there's academia like any other thing, like with, whether it's celebrity or hip hop or artist or anything, there is a mechanism for popularity. And there's a favorite, there's a quote I'm gonna butcher and I'll stop here. It's, it's in one of my favorite books by Francis Stoner Saunders called The Cultural Cold War, uh, the CIA and Arts and Letters or something like that. It's about the post, -second, post World War II moment where England and its allies set upon creating a, a propaganda uh, using culture primarily to produce propaganda that said Western capitalism is the way to go. And it's a very meticulously researched book and it's fascinating. And one of the quotes in there said, uh, talking about uh, uh, an academic magazine put together by MI6, I think is the CIA equivalent over there. Um, and, and they sit, they, the, the, the publisher, the editor is quoted as saying, I'm gonna butcher it here, but the point was, we don't have to pick someone and say, write this, study this, produce this. We just set up the rubric by which people are measured for advancement or selected for advancement, and people will f fill the role. And then we, they'll, they'll come and we just plug them in. The point being, in academia, journalism, rap, anything else, there's a mechanism for selecting who will be prominent and who will be marginalized. And I would argue that there's a politics associated with that. I hope, again, that someone answers your question. Um, so, I don't know that I, um, I, I, I didn't think that I, even, even when I was in graduate school, I didn't think I would get a job. Um, <laughs> I mean, I was pretty sure that I wouldn't because um, I was fairly stubborn about what I wanted to do. Uh, and how I got there was, well, probably from being stubborn. You know, like I was doing work in Illinois, as I stated, you know, like just working, uh, you know, like an after school program, a high school and at a university. And I was making music, you know, and, and I always felt like that, I mean, that was a thing. I was just interested in really just trying to be a good rapper. I think that there was a point in time when um, I probably did feel like, you know, like I wanted to be famous. Um, but, you know, by that time, I was done with that, and it was just like, I, I love what this does. Like, I love, 
you know, the, the space that I get to create with people, um, making things, and then also kind of like intervening in some of these questions that you might have where a rapper might be able to like, like literally go into the meaning of a word and change the way that people perceive it. And there's, I think, like some incredible power there. Um, and you know, like shout out to like the spoken word poets who, who do, you know, who do this quite a bit as well. Um, but then, you know, like something happened with, um, you know, where there's a thing that folks do with rap and with hip hop where like folks love to use it to like, you know, like I said, it's like to, to demonstrate the veneer of progress. Um, if you say something is hip hop, then you'll get a diverse, a diverse group of people to show up and then you take a whole bunch of pictures and then like those are the ones that go on all of the brochures because like you got like diverse butts and seats. And I think that this happens, you know, in a lot of different places. So um, I, was, I was doing some work that I think that folks thought was like that, where they were advertising to get a whole bunch of people in a place. Um, I was also like working where folks would come to me for expertise about like how this work might be done. You know, like how might we connect, you know, like old traditions, literary traditions, you know, like all of these different things. And once like the, the flat came where somebody was questioning, why are we doing hip hop with these young people? Why are we like talking to young people about rap? And, and also, you know, like questioning like these grand historical narratives. Um, through, through this music, and it just sounds offensive. It sounds like indoctrination or whatever. Well, you know, I'm like, well, I mean, I can talk to a school board. Like, I just went to a conference and presented about this exact same thing, and they're like, well, no, we need an expert. <laughs> and then, you know, like, my question was like, well, where are they at? And, um, you know, it's at that point that I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess I probably, I mean, I don't know how they make experts. But like my assumption is if you get a PhD, then maybe you would be, now, and I, I mean, no bullshit, because like there's also like a situation where, you know, in the same place, I was like, well, you know, I wanna, I wanna teach, um, I wanna te teach uh, dual credit composition, like advanced composition, so that folks can get high school credit and get, you know, like college credit. I had a master's degree in writing, and uh, the person who was over the program told me I hadn't taken enough writing classes. <laughs> And so I, I knew it was bullshit. Like, like that's the thing right there. That like, like we need an expert, and then like you go become an expert, and then people will tell you, no, we need a different kind of expert, mm -hmm. uh, or expertise means something else. Mm -hmm. And so then when I got to, you know, when I got to Clemson, you know, working on the on the like the stuff that I was working on, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm about to fuck this up. <laughs> and so that's that was the goal. And so like, I mean, I'm saying with that in mind, I truly thought, yeah, I probably won't get a job. I go back to Illinois and do some of the stuff that I was doing uh, because I had uh, I was afforded the opportunity to go and study, and I think that I just didn't care enough about like what it meant on the other side because you know like I would just I'd find something else to do. I'd perform, I'd make music, I'd write more or whatever. And so um, I applied to the job that I'm in right now um, because I thought that it was absurd that somebody thought that they could like a university like UVA. Was like we're we're going to name someone professor uh, assistant professor of hip hop in the global south because that's absurd. It's, it's absolutely absurd that that's a thing, and um, and that nobody. I mean, I guess nobody could stop them, but that nobody did stop them. And so for a really long time, I'm like, I'm not doing that. That's absurd. And um, and then you know, I got some I think pretty good advice from a mentor who was like, well, you know, like. If you get, if, if you're in that position, then you can talk about how it's absurd. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> testing, testing. All right, good. All right, check one, two, one, two. You good? So we have great artists like Talib Kweli, Big Chris, uh, Kendrick Lamar, who are expert at putting the best in. What are some ways that you've seen artists have cleverly made the message more palatable so that they can better receive by the public whilst they're not deviating from the true essence of fruition and practical creators? I don't think it happens. So, so, so the question, as I understood, it, is where you know, after 
naming people like Kendrick Lamar, Talib Kweli, Big Crit. Is there a way to package the message of pro radical, progressive messaging, package the medicine in the art in a way that makes it palatable to audience, right? Of course, when they first start off, they, are, they become experts at putting the medicine in the change. They get to a certain point where they can, their voice is respected, and then they can you know, get the message in a true essence. What are some other ways you've seen up and coming artists by you know, to make it more palatable? Right, so that's what I'm saying. I don't, this is part of the mythology as I understand. It does not happen that way. There is no historical exception to the fact that you cannot be rich, radical, and famous simultaneously. There is zero exception to that rule. So I just think you have to look, so, so my general approach is if someone is popular, you have to look a little more carefully at the message. So for instance, you mentioned Kendrick Lamar. So I mean, like, no disrespect to the art. Like, there's, there, there's, there's nothing that I've heard that is that is decidedly, overtly, radically threatening in the messaging that isn't balanced by some other activity. So, for instance, my favorite that I just used in my class the other day is is um, his latest uh, Cash App commercial. So you want to talk about this is to me, which is the perfect example of how hip hop is used and historically in a colonial context. So you talk about delivering, a, a packaging the medicine. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that commercial? Have you all seen this commercial? Kendrick Lamar's Cash App commercial? So it starts off with a close up of this brother that you've never seen of, more or less just, you know, on, you know coming off the coin, you know, yeah, I mean, I did this, that, and the third, you know what I'm saying, and I was trying to get a barbershop, not having one that did the dice game, and that, 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 tried to roll, that, 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 lost, that, that, crapped out, blah, 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 blah. Then it pans back a little bit, and you see he's talking to Kendrick, and Kendrick says, Oh, I see. Okay, this is so. So you're saying that you had money that you were going to invest in a barber shop, but you lost it on a dice game. You gambled it. That's what you're saying. That it peels back again. You see this white man, this business white man, and you see that Kendrick is literally translating the the the, the hood commentary for the for the white business for the white man to give his business advice back through Kendrick. No, you need to diversify and just invest properly and be wise and smart with your money. And da, 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 da. So then Kendrick takes that, he turns to the brother. So see what I'm saying? I mean, you gotta, yeah, 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 you gotta do this and do that. You've been smart at what you're doing, Jenna, then you've been good. That's, that's what's really happening here. The pain that black people suffer and try to express musically gets distilled through some nonsense in the machinery and turned into something that gets passed back to the community that says, oh no, here's some more capitalism and investment and cash apping and all this other kind of stuff. And then we're conditioned at this point because by now, your generation and the younger generations have missed the historical moment where people in hip hop said, we're not doing Sprite commercials. We're not doing beer commercials. We're not selling out. That Run DMC Adidas stuff was treachery. That history gets removed and gets turned again into a positive. Because Russell Simmons gets to tell the narrative until he has to hide away in some island somewhere because he's been raping and abusing women all these years and can't even come back to this country. That's the Def Jam success story. So my point is, there is no, I'm slipping that radical message in. My, my criticism of Talib Kweli goes back 20 years. You can't have this, no disrespect, he's brilliant. And it's not even just of him, it's really of the, 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 the of any, it's the, when you do a Toyota commercial and a Coke commercial, that erases your radicalism immediately. There's, there's no amount of radical rap that you can deliver to the people that's gonna outdo the symbolic, semiotic damage of people seeing you do a Coke, when Common did Coke commercials and Toyota commercials, everything, he's, it's off, no wonder he's doing movies now, of course. And it's no disrespect to him. I grew up on Queen Latifah, ladies first, fists up, head wrap, Africa medallions, now she's an FBI agent, doing Revlon commercials. Ice-T said, fuck the police cop killer. He hasn't done a role that wasn't a cop in his whole career. <laughs> LL Cool J is a cop. And copaganda, that's a whole other thing. What does that mean? You got famous rappers portraying the state. George Jackson called this out 50, 60 years ago. The legendary George Jackson, who nobody hears about anymore, said Bill Cosby was playing a FBI agent while we're getting crushed in the black liberation struggle by the FBI. 
Then Bill comes back many years later after George is assassinated, after all those people are assassinated, and Bill wants to tell everybody to pull their pants up and da 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 da. Meanwhile, he's doing what he's been, you know, clearly been with all these women. Meanwhile, meanwhile. So, anyway, my point is I'm sorry, I've gone. My point really is there is, we, we have to break this whole hopefulness, which is understood by those who create the propaganda. It's understood everybody wants to see themselves on the big screen. We have to break that attachment and look critically at it. And when you see something that you appreciate that's coming from this machine, the more you like it, the more critical we have to be of it. What are they doing? Because they're the ones putting their medicine in the, in the product and giving it to us. We're not, we're not beating them. It's fantasy. We have to be very clear on that. All right, I'll, let me stop there. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I think I agree. The, the, um, I think that one of the things, so one of the things that, because, well, folks who I appreciate, like, I, I imagine the folks who just call them haters, you know, like that, <laughs> that, um, that, you know, like you go and get a PhD because you just want to sit around and be a hater. Um, and especially like the folks who do critical media studies, stuff like that. And working with those folks, reading their work, and, um, and then being asked questions, I think the way that I try to translate it is that like fandom, well fandom makes you make bad arguments. Mm. Right? Like, because fandom curates good feelings about things. You know, like it's it's all it's about appreciation, and so I mean I mentioned it. Uh, you know that that like I like to look at my work as study, and I think that being a student of something is much different than being a fan of it. But also being a student of something like might ruin your ability to be a fan of it. Um, and so like if I if I'm wearing my my fandom cap, there's a whole lot of dope shit that gets made, and I'm like yo like I wanna I wanna listen to the like I, I like listen to the craft of Jay Z. You know, like on this whole dead song. But like, I'm not looking for the medicine in that. Like that, because like it's not, because it's, it's not there. But like as a fan, like studying the craft, like we, we gotta play the class, we gotta talk about it. But then like we also, or well, we don't have to, but I, I would like to. But then like if we're going to kind of like do the student thing, then it's like, okay, so what is it all about? Like what is the appeal and how is it doing all of those things? And, um, and I think that those are, like, if we, if we conflate the two, then like, we, we end up making really bad arguments about things that we might otherwise be really sharp about, or might otherwise be, you know, like, um, you know, like the same thing with like Marvel movies, like, or, or any, any movie that, that you watch and you like really love, like you're wild, you love the sort of the deep bass in the theater and the popcorn and all of that. But then like when you get to like after the film is over and you're wow, then it's like, okay, so what do we just watch? <laughs> and that's a different conversation than, you know, like I felt like, you know, I felt drawn into it. So I mean I, maybe that just comes from being a person who's, you know, and um, you know, or at least like coming from, you know, uh, rhetorics that like I'm looking at all of the, the arguments that people are making and I believe that fandom, like I said, makes you make bad arguments. And, um, and so I'm always having to like, take that off. And then unfortunately, when I'm talking to students, then it's like, well, what do you like? And I'm like, yeah, I feel like there are better questions than that. You know? <laughs> um, because like, it's like, well, what can we do with it? It doesn't matter what I like. You know, like, um, it seems like the least important thing is about, like, I mean, that, that we're doing, if we're studying, is talking about what we like. You know, like, nobody, I mean, I don't know, I don't like to kill a mockingbird. You know, but you know, it might be interesting to study. Dom? Right on. We're running out of time. We got, we got time for one and a half more questions. One and a half. One. Okay, two and a half questions. So one, two, and then I have a half. We're running out of time. Who does, okay, who does the half question? Hi, man. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my question is about uh, sort of the categorization of. Uh, Hip hop or rap, um, specifically conscious rap, right? So, um, who fits in there? Who doesn't? There are some artists that, with some of their art, some of their work they do, but then with the others they don't. So, more specifically, what are some underlying mechanisms about these 
these categorizations and, and what do you all what do you think about that? <laughs> Yeah, I feel like the categorization, what I mean by like genres actually is that it feels like when you talk about genres, it's, 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 it's actually really, really interesting that, that we get so fixated on genre, but it makes sense because I feel like genre, like the categories themselves are just ways that things are sold um, more than anything, you know, and, and I think that like those, those categories like largely correspond to like, like bodies, like literally like the the people who like either they're supposed to be like selling it to, or the people who are supposed to like be selling it like from the body that they're that they're rapping from, and with that, then I think all of that stuff kind of um, you know kind of falls apart uh, because it's really because then you see yourself engaging in like somebody's marketing plan more than any like true categories, you know, like a thing that's like called conscious rap um, or a thing that's called. Uh, you know, I don't know any of, of the other things. Um, and it feels like historically that holds. Um, but yeah, so so I don't know. I mean, like if you, I mean, to, to mention some of the sort of popular artists that people talk about, you know, as being conscious or conscientious. And then, like I said, it, it, it doesn't work, as Dr. Paul said, it doesn't, I don't think that it holds up to closer scrutiny when you look at what they're saying or what they're doing. Um, and so I don't know, I guess I would ask like, like what kinds of artists do you mean by conscious? Uh, because then we might, but then like this also might just turn into people like shitting on your favorite rappers. <laughs> and then, and, you know, like we don't want to like ruin that for you. And, I mean, we do want to ruin that for you, but you might not want it ruined for you, you know? Yeah, in the interest, uh, I guess, of time, I would, I would just simply say that, that genre creation has always been fictitious and about, uh, colonial division and marketing, which is again a euphemism for psychological warfare, I want to keep saying that. That, that um, you know, so all of these categories, uh, my, my godfathers always say, you know, they keep calling it jazz, it's African American classical music. Uh, that's his version, you know, and, and then why do you call it rap and R&B and soul and why is it urban so that it can be sold and marketed without the black people being considered? Uh, you know why? You know all of that is so that that the that the apparatus, the handful of companies and their private equity groups and senior owners and advisors uh, uh, that want to manage popularity as a mechanism to destroy political uprising. That's you know. But what they they want they want to be able to target the, their in, in, uh, um, embedded messaging as best they can. And the, to do that, you need to separate everybody demographically, and then you can tailor to every segment of the community. And the better way to do that musically is to create these, these false categories. Uh, but anyway, yeah, go ahead, can, please. Can I just ahead. say that I think that, I mean, so this is like, because I'm, I'm just going to do it now. Um, that, um, like, there was a point in time, like, Ruckus Records was like the place where, you know, like, you got all of the underground hip hop, like, all of your favorite underground artists were signed to Ruckus or whatever. But, like, at some point, Rupert Murdoch was the major stake, stakeholder of Ruckus Records. So, you mean to tell me the people who bring you Fox News are also the people who bring you underground conscious hip hop? I mean, they were, they, their defense at the time would have been, <laughs> well, it was his son. His son, but no, but, but he, no, 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 I'm saying, well, because well, I, I think it was actually his son that owned it, but I think it's what well, your point. No, okay, but your point, yeah, either way, I think your point, yeah. Yeah. it don't yeah. matter. I just, like, yeah. Because, like, I mean, like, yeah. like, my pops always Fox News, but, like, I just love underground hip hop. No, no, I get it, that's what I'm saying. I but, mean, I, yeah, absolutely. And no, then, I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And then to me, yeah, there's so much more. Go ahead, go ahead. I don't want to, yeah, absolutely. Gets, gets out, but I was thinking about like um, if 
Like, I know black visibility is not black power, but what um, can you say about people, you know, like, for instance, Beyonce, that, you know, means so much like <laughs> oh, feminism Lord. and like She's black a... feminism. I know that it's not <laughs> enough of liberation, but um, how about that kind of emotional worth? If there is any. So, so I will be very short on this one and equally, and, and equally vague. The, to the first part of your, your question, there is no such thing as decolonizing one thing without a broad revolution, to put it. So there is no, you're not gonna decolonize media or decolonize hip hop while the broader colonial project is going on. So we have to join organizations, build movements, have to do all the kinds of things that have, have ever always been on the table for people in political struggle. That's, that's, that's it, it's that easy. The other thing, the other thing is, uh, um, to, to the second part, this is, the, 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 relatively speaking, not that I have you know, this social media thing, but relatively speaking, the only time I went really viral is when after that Super Bowl that Beyonce performed in, I posted a meme that on one hand said, had a picture of Beyonce and on the other side a picture of Asada Shakur. And I just simply asked, if Beyonce is a revolutionary, then what is she? And I got a level of backlash that I've never, I mean, it was spooky, to be honest with you. I, I, I was like, I was naive, even as I studied something to, to the effect that that, to, to see what people would actually say. Now, Sada Shakur very quickly is the exiled member of the Black Panther Party and Black Liberation Army who is now in Cuba with a bounty on her head, raised by the former black president, spoken to by the, the head of the FBI who was himself black, announced by, a, I mean, the head of a, the, the, with the, this, the senior attorney general at the time, uh, a black attorney general, black president, and a black FBI agent announced the, rise, the raising of her bounty. Uh, um, and then, what's his name, reiterated it after Biden, um, uh, Obama left. Um, the point is, she was a pan-Africanist, is a pan-Africanist, socialist, anti-imperialist revolutionary who was shot, tortured, imprisoned, exiled, etc. If Beyonce is now a revolutionary with a $50 million Pepsi deal, etc., and so on and so forth, well, what then is a side of them? What are we really saying means, what are we talking about when we say revolution? I think my colleague here just said a few minutes ago, uh, something to the effect of how do we define conscious? I believe I heard you say something like, what, what does conscious mean? Well, if conscious, if radical can be Beyonce, then what are we saying about Asada? And I'm saying Asada was right, is right. So then how can Beyonce, so, so, so that's, anyway, I, I said I was gonna be short, that's as, that's as short as I could, but anyway. It's, anyway. Yeah, no, and so I think like, to try to, yeah, I, I think that's important because I think that there's a there's something there. It's just like the, the question is, what is the something? And so, you know, I say the same thing about the, um, the uh, like the, the, well, Beyonce Super Bowl or like the more recent rap Super Bowl, you know, where uh, oh, wow. Eminem comes out and he takes the knee, you know, and, and all of this. And they're like, I don't know, like they're, they're crib walking on Compton. Is that, is that something happen? like that? Yeah. And Kendrick edited his All Right yeah, track yeah, to take out the police killer, the Popo killer. That's and right. The same thing that uh, and, and Dr. Dre did as well. That's right. That's um, right. And um, <laughs> like the term that I use that, that you know, a friend and I, a friend and I used to, to describe it was like rap washing. Mm. It's like um, what, what was happening was like to to make this exchange was to to exchange rap for. A kind of monitoring of the image of the of the NFL uh, to attempt to make it seem as if they had a deeper investment um, with like black struggle than they actually had, and it was like I mean it was incredibly effective the way that it worked, effective as well. Um, and you know like this is I mean similar to you know like the Kendrick Lamar uh, performance where you know he's walking in chains or the Beyonce performance. There's definitely a thing that's happening, and there is like some there are some emotional stakes and people really do feel something that's there. But like that thing that you feel, it, I think that like more often than not, it is effective manipulation more than it is like actual, like, you know, like revolutionary spirit. Now, I'm not saying that you might not be inspired to like do something, you know, like other than what those folks are doing, but I just don't imagine that the, like the revolution that we believe is going to happen is going to be sponsored by Pepsi. <laughs> 
Um, it just feels highly unlikely. All right, I, I got the box. Um, and, and first, I want to say y'all did go a little bit towards that smoke in that last response. You said you didn't want it, but you walked towards it. Uh, the house is, is checking for you. Um, and, and I'm not trying to, uh, we, we really got to wrap up. We're pretty much over time, but I wanted to, to toss a question out before we left. Um, and I really wanted to, to lift up some of the things that you all said as well, in particular around the extraction and cooptation of black cultural production, and sort of this narrative around uh, hip hop being framed in certain spaces as a pathway to escape material conditions by participating in the coordinated extraction of their cultural production, and that, and that uh, production being commodified and deployed uh, to maintain the colonial capitalist project that is actively harming their community, and this notion around uh, the genre of bodies and how particular bodies are leveraged in these spaces, uh, and that the introduction of this genre of writing into the academy is a particular thing uh, of significance. But I also have heard you say there's this connection that's being made between rapper and narrative of violence. Uh, and, and this sort of reiterated messaging and symbolism uh, that occurs and how the, the through line is definitely the connection between both between what the two of you were both saying. But I'm also interested in uh, your insights for this group in particular uh, around how when I hear the word rapper, my thinking is genius. So, so when I think about the work of um, uh, Bettina Love and other folks who are sort of speaking to the cultural love of hip hop. Can, can you all just take a minute to say a little bit about the extraordinariness right, of hip hop as a genre itself? To communicate, what are your thoughts around just like the cultural wealth and the brilliance and the genius of hip hop? And that's not trying to put the administrative nice bow on it at the end. No, I think that's important. You got to be able to shout out, you know, some of the, you can go ahead, yeah. yeah. Um, no, well, I mean, I guess that, like, like I said before, there was this, there, there was this thing that I, that I thought I wanted to do, you know, like when I was, I don't know, like middle school and high school. And that's a thing completely different than what I, what I currently do. And, um, and you know what, what? What I'm doing now, I think I owe to uh, being able to share space with some of the incredible MCs that I've met. You know, like some of those people are family members, my brothers. Some of them, you know, like some of my. I, I mean, like my, my best friend is in prison right now, um, and you know he put like his freedom on the line to like make sure. The thing that I wanted to do with music was something that we that we realized together collectively, um, and I think that you know he's an incredibly selfless person who taught me you know like yeah like more more than I realized in the moment and you know like every day it seems scarier that that you know that that, that was like that at some point, um, but those lessons then come to inform um, a teaching practice then that is always sort of aiming to redirect the attention from the thing that I thought I wanted back then and closer to the kind of thing that I hope to do now. Um, and I don't know that I would have gotten that through hip hop. I don't think that I got it in any classroom. Um, I think that like what we might consider a, um, you know, like an alternative curriculum that came through, like just understanding how, you know, like how to write a rhyme or like what it meant when somebody said, you know, like when, when someone said, Somebody said I could rap and they weren't able to defend that with the thing that they said they could do. Then, I mean, like that's worse than failing the test in any, in any academic setting. Um, and so, I don't know, I mean, I think that, you know, my, my hope is not to like give that over to academia so that, like, or to like try to make people recognize it as like the way that we might make other people with PhDs who rap. Um, I think that that's equally equally absurd, um, or as absurd as you know what I, what I was talking about earlier. But what I do, 
what I do want to claim is that legacy that's already there. You know, like all of the work that has been put in, you know, through like these like these alternate spaces, like those uh, after school programs, or you know, like the like the rap house in Decatur that was on El Dorado Street, where you could go in and like just like sit down and talk to older folks who knew a whole lot about rhymes and a whole lot about history, and you know, be at the at, you know at the open mics and those kinds of things, because those were the things that made me want to learn more. Um, during the time period when the only thing I wanted to do was rap and become famous. Um, and so I think that I owe a great deal to those hip hop communities that don't look anything like what anybody's movie is going to like show you, like that version of it. Like it's not, it's, it's not that thing. You know, it's not the thing that comes on, you know, like on, like on the Hulu show or whatever. It's, um, it, it's an entirely different thing that, um, that, that I feel schooled by and I feel honored to have like, as an intellectual tradition that um, I take everywhere that I go. Um, and to, you know, I don't know, to shout out specific people, you know, would be, I think it would be more difficult because I would hate to leave some folks out, but you know, just like Decatur, Illinois, you know, and, and the places, you know, up and down the state where, you know, we were running to, you know, like to go and do, you know, like $25 features. Um, yeah, like those, those are the things that like, it wasn't, it wasn't any of those other things. So it's not, I don't know if, like the word that I would use is just like, it was, yeah, it, it shaped the scholar that, you know, like that, that, um, you know, that I am and that I want to become. Um, and so like that, that's a hip hop thing. That's a thing from hip hop that would exist without a PhD or without, you know, like a university that um, would validate it. And I, and I guess that's also why I said, you know, I, it really wouldn't matter. I mean, it matters to have a job to be able to like pay your bills, but like that wasn't the thing that I was, that I was really aiming for. And by the time that, you know, like all of these things started to happen, you know, I was pretty, pretty sure about, you know, what I needed and what I didn't need. So, I, well, I'm gonna shout out one, uh, um, if I don't, if I don't say, you know, at least this name, uh, I would, you know, uh, Maimuna Yusuf, aka Mumu Fresh, is the baddest MC singer on the planet. It's just a rap, pun intended. Um, so check her out if you haven't already. It will blow your mind, and you will see. In fact, when you, if, if you haven't heard of her already, as soon as you Google her and look at her music and her videos and her work. You're gonna, the first thing you're gonna say is, man, 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 Jared was right, man. <laughs> There's clearly a colonial apparatus that's making me unaware of her. Um, Cause she's, and she's a genius. And the, the part of, the, the point really is, uh, to, to, to the specifics of your question, is that the, the, the colonial process, the, co the process of colonialism must initially wipe out, of course, as I said earlier, any, any physical threat, but then it must take the genius of the people it's colonizing and turn it against. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, even in the lyrics, even in the rhymes I don't like in terms of the political content, there's genius in there. I mean, you can't, you can't tell me that even as somebody, you know, again, Jay-Z has been my biggest contradiction my entire, I mean, I, I can't imagine a better rapper other than my Muna Yusuf. Maybe Lauren Hill, if she if she had you know could, could you know you know somebody. But in terms of a, of an MC, Jay Z is is undeniably a genius, and he admitted on tracks, "I am going to dumb it down so I can be successful." He literally said it. I'm going to slow down the cadence. I'm going to dumb down the content so I can become the boss. I'm that he he literally said it. Uh, um, and, and the point being that the genius has to be suppressed. It has to be turned against. That's the, 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 the threat. Uh, that was the point in, in Stoner Saunders' work. The genius in the cultural production is there. How do we use it to convey messages that will work for the political process we have in mind? And that's what I think we have to be aware of. And that's what is always the, the, the biggest struggle for me in terms of, of, of uh, um, my approach and my unpopular um, uh, analyses is that 
is that I'm often critical of real genius. When I briefly mentioned The Woman King earlier, or even Black Panther, it's not that there's not genius and brilliance in it. In fact, it's because of the talent that makes the content more damaging. If they were whack, it would be easy. You just say, that's whack. Look at how whack it is. They look horrible, they sound horrible, they can't, you know. I mean, again, as I joke all the time, but seriously, crack cocaine, I mean, is good. That's why it works. Crack is good. Not that it's good for you, but it, it is successful in doing what it does because it's damn good. That's the point. If it wasn't good, it would not addict anybody. That's the whole point. French fries just as bad, but if they weren't good, they wouldn't addict anybody. That's the point. So you can't, you can't, have, anyway, so that's, that, that's the best way I can answer it. I mean, it is, it is the genius of these colonized people that is always, my, I'll stop here. One of my favorite professors, uh, Ayeli Bakari, used to talk about this uh, all the time. And he would point out the fact that in all of the, the imperial centers, the, the West prides itself on all of the artifacts it has collected from its colonized. So in every major metropole is this African art exhibit. Is this, and now we have a hip hop museum. And now we have a new black museum and the indigenous museum. DC is littered with museums paying tribute to people and movements and art that of, of, of people who have been ripped off and destroyed to this day are being destroyed. They are collecting, the, they're warehousing the, the, the colonial victories and then telling us we should be happy about it. You get to see hip hop in the Smithsonian. What the hell I want that for? That's a sign that it's a wrap, that it's been, pun intended, wrapped up. Anyway. I'll stop there. Let me stop there. I'll stop there. No, it's because I'm joking. If I was black, I'd be irrelevant. There it is. Thank you all. It is. Thank you. Thank you.